And if so, what will come next? Now, there's not necessarily a next, of course. People are always discovering that they weren't really cut out to be teachers after all, or they're not truly entrepreneurs, or, you know, we, we have these crises in our lives. And they don't necessarily require conceptual gymnastics. On the other hand, I think we're more comfortable with the idea of many, many personalities in our species than we are with many, many sexualities. And also, I think the idea of sexual orientation tends to be more firmly attached to a notion of uh, say, a genetic determination or a biological determination. Certainly somebody with my kind of theoretical meaning would be inclined to describe these life changes without invoking pre-existing, predetermined, uh, predeterminative essences. But of course, my meanings are quite beside the point. These are very broad social changes, with all the variation and uh, unruliness these changes bring with them. If the idea of a static, biologically encoded true self is eventually destabilized, perhaps partially by our own efforts, what will be the consequences? How will we, as societies, come to terms with the groups among us who struggle for decent treatment and who struggle for full, full personhood. I think that the notoriously slippery and, uh, slippery and stubborn notion of will, which was dis discussed a few minutes ago, is often very much embedded in these discussions. We ask, could the person have done otherwise? Of course, you, know, you could have decided not to be gay. Okay. This ancient split, then, between the body and mind runs like a fault line through the nature-nature debate. The emotions, for example, are traditionally associated with the biological and are more body-like than reason. These are all the assumptions that have been challenged by many of the people who are here or were going to be here but couldn't be here. And yet I think these categories are dissolving before our very eyes. What next? This brings me to my second and last issue. The New York Times recently ran an article called Neurodiversity Forever, colon. The disability movement turns to brains. It describes the movement among people with disabilities to demand acceptance for their behavioral quirk. A visitor to a website on Asperger's syndrome, which is a kind of uh, autism, asks whether a certain person was unwilling or truly un incapable of behaving appropriately. Or elsewhere in the article, a man speaks of enormous sense of relief at receiving a diagnosis of attention deficit disorder, ADD. Meanwhile, his family is rolling its eyes and seeing this as simply another excuse for misbehavior and irresponsibility. The article, which is very short, very, very packed, absolutely vibrates with this tension between the moral and the medical judgment of behavior and uh, much the same thing between willed and symptomatic behavior. If you think about it, uneasily mediating these alternatives, there's always the question of the bodily reality of disease or disability. In fact, this, uh, the author of this article observes that the quest for acceptance is made more difficult by the fact that, quote, the biological basis of many brain disorders can't be easily verified. 
And yet, we have these astonishing technical advances, these amazing imaging capabilities. They make it increasingly likely that certain kinds of behavioral differences will be seen and will be correlated with wiring diagrams. And in fact, uh, Antonio Damasio is quoted in the article about the growing diversity of such diagrams. Seems to me the more such diagrams are found, the more difficult it's going to be to point to the brain as a way of deciding for us what's normal and what's not, what's diseased and what is not. This goes to the very heart, I think, of what it means then for us to be persons, what it means to have, uh, to be self. We say, was the body responsible or was the mind? Could the person have done otherwise? The first question, was the body responsible or the mind, I find very hard to interpret. I just don't know how to think about it. But the second question, could the person have done otherwise, persists. And I think it persists because it's, it's thought to shed light. I'm sorry, the first question persists, bodies versus mind, persists because people think that it sheds light on the second. Could the person have done otherwise? Am I running over? Yes, okay. Um, I do think that this, uh, the second question, could we have done otherwise, is famously recalcitrant. I'm not going to try to answer it. But I think that the vain hope that disputes about nature and nurture can shed light on it really help those debates keep going and do not help us. So what do these developments demand of us? We've never had roofs, after all, just as we've never been modern, as Luna Latour points out. But who knows, maybe it would be refreshing to acknowledge the exposure very openly and to draw on the full measure of our inventiveness and our flexibility to face what's coming. Thank you.